Hi everyone, I'm Beverly Murphy and I'm a moderator on the Facebook forum called Disulfurum for Lyme. And I'm here with the two men that have put Disulfurum for Lyme on the map. Dr. J. Rajadest from Stanford University and my, my doctor, Dr. Ken Ligner. So um, we're going to talk to Dr. Rajadest first and what's uh, happening in his lab and then we're going to talk a little bit about side effects because um, as I moderate the patient forum, there's a lot of discussion about side effects, people are concerned about taking the drug and so there's people have requested that I ask questions about side effects. I'm currently taking the drug and I can say that it has been dramatic for me over the last two months. I wouldn't have been able to sit here today after being at a conference for eight hours. So I'm really excited to touch in with these two guys and hear what they have to say. Yeah, so thank I'm you. turn it over to Dr. Rajas. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lee. It, it's a great opportunity uh, to uh, you know, discuss about uh, possible novel therapies. Uh, and I have a disclosure to tell, uh, like, unlike, unlike Ken, Dr. Kenneth Lainer, I'm not a clinician. So whatever I say, uh, it is just based on my preclinical work and the work we do in the test tubes and the work we do with uh, animals. And my statement should not be taken as a clinical advice. And whatever you hear today, you need to consult your clinician and they, you have to discuss with them and their advice is definitely a must. Uh, so with this, and I just start uh, with our, uh, you know, great journey of developing something which can possibly work in persisters. So we started this program almost uh, in 2011, when the uh, Dean of School of Medicine, he formed a Lyme working group, and uh, he put a lot of immunologists, great work, great, uh, you know, like high quality immunologists, and a neurologist in it because uh, it was well appreciated by Stanford. Pain is a huge problem in Lyme disease. Uh, and uh, we, we know that a lot of patients, even in the West Coast, they are coming to Stanford and uh, the clinicians, they always have a problem because, you know, we uh, clinician thinks maybe they have uh, the antibiotics cleared the uh, Borrelia, but still they have a lingering symptoms. They can't explain it. And if you can't explain it, it's very hard to treat it. So there are a lot of representation uh, there. And then finally, we formed this um, uh, uh, working group, lying working group. And I was invited to join as a drug developer. And I'm, a, I'm basically a drug development guy, yet somebody who cares for delivery. And uh, so I was extremely happy because uh, of this opportunity, because I think uh, for uh, Lyme disease, therapeutic delivery is very, very challenging. So I love challenges and I thought it's a great opportunity uh, to be part of it. Uh, we started from the, you know, scratch from the beginning, you know, almost like a genesis in the beginning. So, you know, we are very fortunate to have a huge uh, library of drugs in already both the FDA approved and unapproved and novel drugs are available. So we had an opportunity to continuously in, in, uh, interact with our eye throughput screening. So what this screening do, they, they just have a coated plates of drugs and then we delivered uh, the, you know, Borrelia to this and then try to see how they grow and if the drug works the borrelia is not growing and we developed a novel method to find out how active the borrelia is so we measure the atp level in very very accurate manner even you know about 20 to 30 borrelias are alive in the plate we can detect it so that's the power of technology we are using and uh, when we saw that we found out, uh, you know, we as you know, we several times we published it. We found a wonderful hits, and then uh, the lead author uh, in a, that work, his name is Dr. Ravindra Potanini. He was so excited to see uh, Diesel from is kind of always coming to the top of his uh, thing, and then um, because the reason. Uh, disulfurum is not a traditional antibiotic. Uh, why? Uh, you know, it's we, we are all excited to 
you know have a, a program and antibiotic program which is not an antibiotic because of you know it's well appreciated now anytime you're exposed to an antibiotic you are hurting your microbiome in the gut and uh, you know we always say that people they refer B it's not just I because we are full of microbiome and this microbiome you know they decide our well-being they also uh, you know they whatever they produce they also uh, kind of uh, uh, decides you know our mood and uh, our pain everything they participate so if you i take an antibiotic or any penicillin derived or you know minocycline or doxycycline we are always going to hurt the uh, gut bacteria we are going to lose all of them we are going to lose a lot of our you know friendly bacteria and disel from because it is very specific to borrelia so it's a great opportunity but it is not um, uh, going to hurt our bacteria. So we are going to have a target uh, therapy for only to Borrelia and at the same time without hurting our gut microbiome. So this was our excitement. Uh, but uh, then, you know, he ranked other molecules also. But uh, when we started working with the from, uh, there was some uh, resistance for using from because uh, uh, maybe all of you are aware Originally, disulfiram was used, uh, developed as an anti-abuse. In fact, the side effect is supposed to be a therapeutic effect. It's a very interesting molecule wow. where people used the side effects as a therapeutic effect mm -hmm. because uh, maybe all of you know this, uh, you know, if, if, in rubber industry in Europe, where people use this as a vulcanizing agent those days, people never use their gloves. So they were exposed to this molecule and uh, because disulfiram is a hydrophobic molecule, they all get absorbed in the way nicotine patch works. They get absorbed and then get into their blood. And then these people without knowing, they just uh, touched a molecule which is terribly against alcohol. And they go and then have their, you know, they, take, they work on Friday, they <coughs> take in the Friday evening booze and then next day, they have a kind of ER situation, very, very bad situation, horrible side effects. And then they all, uh, you know, uh, reported their side effects to their clinician. Unfortunately, something very, very scientifically oriented clinician like Dr. Kenneth Lehner uh, took those ideas, the report, you know, when people report, uh, you know, to a doctor, I always used to tell, like, you know, data is data. Whatever the way it is coming, data is data. So these people, these clinicians, they took this other data and then that came out a great idea. Like, why not we will take this as a therapy? Alcoholism is a huge problem in Europe, especially in Russia. It's a huge problem. It's so bad that it even pushes like average lifetime of men is around, you know, mid fifties at one point. So, so many, you know, people, all of us are stressed. And after the second world war, the economy is so poor and people are all stressed. They always take their booze and then become alcoholic. The entire family loses all the resources because of alcohol. So these two doctors wanted to develop something that will fight against alcoholism. So they used it. And this molecule, how it works, it, it is, they discovered that uh, it inhibit aldehyde dehydrogenases. What are aldehyde dehydrogenases? Aldehyde dehydrogenases are about 19 isoforms we have. These uh, enzymes, they, they, what they do is they de detoxify when we consume alcohol. First, it is converted to acetaldehyde. That acetaldehyde is a very bad molecule, you know, it causes pain. Whatever the side effects you see, hangover is because of acetaldehyde. And if you have a problem of uh, this particular class of enzyme mutation, for example, some of the Asian patients, they have this, that's why they get a red flag. Mm -hmm. Because they, their, their acetaldehyde, they are modifying uh, enzyme aldehyde dehydrogenase is not working for them. It's not working. Uh, so it's not working because of that, 
they get a screen went it's good yeah they they get a very very bad side effects um so the uh, these molecules these enzymes are supposed to be good enzymes and uh, the purpose of disulfiram is inhibiting them why because people they, their clinician they advise don't take alcohol they don't listen but if they are in this tablet and if they take accidental alcohol they are going to have a lot of build up of acetaldehyde that's going to cause a lot of pain and if they are going to have a horrible horrible uh, side effects or in other words a therapeutic effects which originally intended for so this one becomes so this molecule is almost known to people 40 years it's supposed to be a very you know not a very bad molecules but maybe all of you are aware all drugs have side effects but if we always measure the benefit versus the problems if the benefits overweigh the problems then it's a good drug if the problem overweighs the benefit then it's a bad drug uh, recently one of the um, uh, very famous you know highly prescribed molecule is pulled out of uh, the market um, but you know people realize that the problem it is going to cause or is causing is going to be much more than the benefit it is providing so disulfiram is the one which people are very comfortable in prescribing because the benefit it provides that literally taking people out of alcohol it's big thing otherwise you know people will damage their life by becoming an alcoholic <coughs> addicts so people all you know clinicians uh, many of them are very comfortable with uh, uh, this molecule so when i discussed with experts about using this molecule for uh, you know for the treatment of lyme disease they all encouraged me uh, because i i was worried about the side effects you know what if accidentally they take alcohol uh, then my friends told me you know the problems of the persistent lyme disease is giving to people they will take anything you know right. they will uh, because uh, literally anything <laughs> yeah, yeah so the, that's what uh, you know i was uh, told then i thought okay then we will start this as a program then you know we did uh, all this uh, you know repeated a uh, lot of work and then we wanted to ensure whatever we see is a valid valid and uh, then we realized this is not uh, very stable in the blood uh, the reason for that the mechanism in which uh, the alcohol uh, alcohol dehydrogenase sorry inhibitor is different than what the way it is killing the borrelia so we felt the pro drug because when we when people take disulfiram from disulfiram from, you know it degrades into many small small metabolites some cases a bigger metabol is because it interacts with uh, glutathione so you have variety of molecules that is build up in the we don't know which one exactly kills the borrelia we later found out maybe we need to maintain the intact form for a longer period for a therapeutic efficacy to kill or sterilize the in vivo model so this was our finding when we realized this then we thought instead of just giving uh, in a you know crushed ant abuse or you know disulfiram from we decided to encapsulate it and there is a way to avoid the first pass metabolism we have to when the tablet is taken we have to ensure liver is not processing it immediately because liver is the place where it is trashing this molecule into different metabolites and these metabolites <coughs> may be good in uh, in inhibiting the aldehyde dehydrogenase but it is not going to be good in killing the borrelia persistent borrelia so uh, i think you know after several uh, months of work i think we successfully found out a formulation uh, that can literally help uh, sterilizing the bacteria uh, is this is this a reformulation yes okay. so i have to mention uh, this uh, you know like uh, this particular uh, uh, understanding 
why uh, you know you need to reformulate it it came uh, uh, you know mainly because this uh, you know the slow delivery is essential it's because uh, of all the good interactive thing that is happening around me because when the paper came out in 2016 uh, you know ultimately this paper was very enthusiastically looked upon by many people including one famous researcher in our area he was uh, introducing that that of course he uh, he just told this is our work he never told it is his work and all uh, he simply was uh, lauding that work in that video mm -hmm. and uh, the good thing happened after that video this was watched by some of the patients and then they happened to meet uh, my collaborator uh, dr kenneth Lainer. and uh, you know dr kenneth Lainer, extremely uh, scientifically oriented clinician and uh, he decided to try this and uh, and not many people will do this uh, you know they always say the researchers they do these things in mice and test tube how do we know that it's going to work uh, but uh, dr kenneth Lainer took this uh, it's kind of big risk uh, and I, he took that and uh, again you know it's his decision but what is very important thing other people they won't do and what can dr kenneth Lainer did he called me <laughs> so not many people will do that uh, called me and encouraged me we need more research on this it appears it is working <laughs> mm -hmm. so um, the you know there are repeated call and he was uh, trying in fact at one but uh, i got a lot of inputs from dr Lainer uh, about uh, the possible therapeutic uh, effect that's really really you know very encouraging uh, for uh, uh, us can we go back to the reformulation yeah. and can you talk about how that might avoid side effects so so you know i am a i am a structural biologist basically by training uh, i understand uh, inorganic chemistry i understand metal complexation i understand uh, drug delivery I, I am you know currently a director of a drug delivery lab so i understand a drug formulation and so i and i love this molecule why uh, because this molecule uh, it is kind of in a strained uh, uh, structure uh, it's uh, when it get into the uh, uh, to the blood it just uh, looking for something with free sulf uh, sulfhydryl group and then you know just open up into two and then attaching it so that is how it works so that is the first metabolite our body albumin itself can break them into two uh, so we have a plenty of albumin in our blood there is no way i can protect it against albumin but the problem with this before even albumin totally you know get covalently linked with this molecule or breaking this molecule into two other enzymes in the blood can chew them up and then divert them to a different metabolites which is likely to cause a lot of side effects so what we did uh, where, where you know you have plenty of those <coughs> enzymes in liver so in the way when we take a tablet we call it as a first pass metabolism the liver takes all of them it like a security you know they they check everything everything and modify that some of them of course the liver is doing a job for us they kind of because liver is kind of detoxifying everything including disulfuro so it, in the process of detoxifying it is making a lot of toxic products mm -hmm. Uh, so all these enzymes they make a lot of toxic products and these products get into the thing and uh, you know but for uh, people with an alcoholic problem this is not a huge problem because when you have a chronic alcoholism going on then your body different types of enzymes are highly upregulated because your body is prepared to handle these things for these people it's not a huge problem but people with with ongoing you know, some kind of inflammation we call it as a perpetual inflammation especially in preclinical model when animal 
he is exposed to borrelia even an acute infection they have a inflammation in fact today talk i showed some of the <coughs> inflammatory marker how impressively it is upregulated when they are exposed to borrelia mine i mean rat wild type mice they don't develop borreliosis they are designed to be a perfect reservoir that is they live in synergy with borrelia but if you make small mutation in them in one particular receptor they develop disease that's what the that is the animal we are using it but again their chronic disease development is not equal to the chronic disease people are having that means people are having much more perpetual inflammation is going on because of this and when already having an inflammation you give them a disulfiram which is directly you know be going to inhibit lot of aldehyde dehydrogenase in the body that basically they are all de detoxifying enzyme then you know they are going to be lot of side effects so that is the reason we need to deliver it very slowly not a very it, it is something like that anything delivered slowly you are going to have a more efficacious and then they slowly delivered and then they are not going to have a bust release they are not going to have you know the liver is not going to process everything quickly and then make the toxin level goes up so they are going to have much much better efficacy of thing and this this idea amazingly amazingly worked very well in so you fact, think this reformulation will solve a lot of the side effects? Yes, I do. In uh, uh, persistent Lyme disease, pain is real. We do believe uh, with the directions Dysel from ideas driving us. We do. I do believe therapy is also possible. Safer therapy or delivery of <coughs> Dysel from is also possible. Uh, we have a lot of preclinical data to show it is uh, you know possible and then there is a data to show it is sterilizing in the bacteria completely and right now uh, as we speak we are also getting ready with uh, other we always call the major 3 Bs bartonella babesia and borrelia uh, we uh, you know we are just getting our collaborations and then set so that we want to check how it is effectively killing both Uh, Bartonella and Babesia together. If we can show one drug taking care of all these things, I think uh, you know that will make a lot of you know improvement in the way clinicians like Dr. Kenneth Lainer is uh, trying to achieve in their uh, practice. And are there any preliminary results on Babesia and Bartonella? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have right now because in the way we do. Uh, uh you know uh, uh, in the way we do like you know animal experiments we make a preclinical model we get an approval takes few months and then once we get an approval then we repeat several times before we publish a paper because we need to be very careful when we tell the world that it is going to be effective for bartonella the same thing we did for diselfram also and uh, i just uh, you know ask maybe that can a plane to answer this question about uh, the effect of uh, uh, this drug on babesia should we turn it over to you yeah okay good so do you i know the the questions that patients have are obviously side effects is a big one but also what we just talked about the babesia and bartonella how effective do you feel they are well i i can only go based on my own clinical experience and this is just as a clinician it um disulfiram seems to have good activity against Lyme and babesiosis just on a clinical basis i'm underwhelmed by what it does for bartonella mm -hmm. it's not clear to me that it's particularly active for bartonella mm -hmm. um but uh a number of the patients that i'm dealing with have, have good evidence of both Lyme and babesiosis and it's usually clinically possible to to segregate out the the symptoms of the two mm -hmm. and uh and uh it, it seems that the sulfur has good activity against both of those do you think that if we added another antibiotic in would that help against bartonella 
I mean, if it has some partial. Well, I, I think if if it has little, if any, activity against Bartonella, mm -hmm. then you you may need to figure out a strategy to treat the Bartonella either mm -hmm. concurrently or sequentially mm -hmm. with the disulfiram. Okay. So, and uh, there are some patients of mine have opted to just treat with disulfiram only in order to see what that does, mm -hmm. and some other patients have been, not been comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. and wanted to be treated concurrently um, for Bartonella with other medications while being treated with disulfiram. Unlike this. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, since we're talking to you now for a moment, can you speak a little bit about the side effects and um, what you're seeing as side effects because it's something that scares people from mm -hmm. wanting to start the drug? And then if there's anything that you think would be helpful or that you're seeing is helpful in your practice with your patients to help deal yeah. with side effects. Well, th this is, for me, a new drug that I have not previously had experience with. And my experience with it, even now, is still limited. Right? I've had about two years of experience with it. Mm -hmm. I think it, 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 anytime a, a practitioner uses a new agent, there's a there's a learning curve, and it takes time to. Uh, so I'm I'm just learning. I'm just trying to figure out how to use this particular agent, you know, off the shelf disulfiram, and uh, you know, the the first three patients, I I just somewhat arbitrarily chose a dose because mm -hmm. I didn't really know, and uh, I just chose the the upper limit of the usual dose that might be used for treating using it for alcoholism, which is 500 milligrams a day, and, and the first three patients happened to weigh around 200 pounds. And in retrospect, just by chance, I mean, I think that was not a bad dose for their weight. Mm -hmm. um, one of the patients handled it pretty well. The second patient was basically bed bound for the whole six weeks that, that he was on it, and you know, so it really knocked the hell out of him. And then the third patient tried even though he, he, he weighed 220 pounds, he tried the 500, and he was a guy who was actually fairly well functioning, and going on the 500, it, it, it just and made it almost him. impossible to function. So on his own advice, because he's an independent type guy, he, he cut way back to a half of a 250 every other day, and that he was able to tolerate, and then he slowly ramped it up over about two months until he got to 500 milligrams, 500 milligrams a day, and he was able to complete two months of that. But as far as the side effects, I mean, we have seen a significant um, amount of side effects in patients, mm -hmm. even though it's very, very potent. But uh, <clears throat> we've had uh, a fair number of patients who develop um, neuropathic symptoms, mm -hmm. numbness, tingling, burning. Um, Just so our sort of probably inadequate mm -hmm. data, but on the Facebook forum, it seems to be somewhere between like 20 to almost 30 percent mm -hmm. reporting some kind of neuropathic pain. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if those are accurate um, numbers. I, I, don't I don't really have numbers, but it, it's a significant number. And, mm -hmm. then, and then, of course, in, as you may recall in, in, in the interview that, that Harrison Cheneau mm -hmm. had with me, he raised a very good question. You know, is it really disulfiram neuropathy? Mm -hmm. or, or, it, or, well, or <laughs> because, because li Lyme mm -hmm. can cause a neuropathy itself. Right. And it's quite conceivable to me that there could be sub- clinical involvement of the nerves with Borrelia in the nerves, so that when you treat with disulfiram, it's, it may not be a disulfiram neuropathy, it may be provoking, you might call it a yarish hertzheimer like effect mm -hmm. in, in peripheral nerves that are already um, infiltrated with low levels of Borrelia, mm -hmm. you know, so I mean, it, it, that or was a very... Could it be that the nerves are already slightly inflamed, sort of sub-perceptual, and then the inflammation from the disulfiram takes your neuropathy, which is probably already there anyway, you know, your nerves are already well, slightly, is that what you're yes, saying? That's exactly what I'm okay. saying. That, that, in other words, mm -hmm. there, there could be subclinical involvement of the peripheral nerves, and then when you treat with disulfiram and, and you're, you're, um, you're damaging Borrelia and then resulting in the of cytokines. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. How do you tease apart neuropathy that's strictly from the disulfiram versus the effects of um, Borrelia that's already involving the nerves, even though that might be subclinical at the, when you start. Mm -hmm. So 
but so you're not sure about I'm not entirely sure but it, it do you it, have a it, leaning towards one because we're debating this on the Facebook yeah I, mean, I want I, to be right <laughs> <laughs> well I'm, I'm I, I, I don't really know okay. but I think you have to keep that in mind that it, maybe it is the cell phone neuropathy or maybe it's the effect of the cell phone on nerves that are already compromised by virulent infection mm -hmm. but whatever the case some of the for some patients the neuropathy becomes so severe yeah. that it's really I mean you have mm -hmm. to stop right you which know? we've we've seen people report that yeah so how many patients do you have that have just stopped because of neuropathy well I mean or side effects, in, in that subset of patients mm -hmm. who are affected by it um, it depends on how severe it is and also you have to weigh well is it worth putting up with some some neuropathy temporarily mm -hmm. if you think that it's most likely to resolve after you stop it if being on the drug is worth it in terms of knocking out or knocking down the virulent infection so that has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis mm -hmm. with each patient with them being informed as well as you can but also you know like usually the neuropathy from desulfiram resolves but not always so you mm -hmm. can't even guarantee the patient that if you stop that the neuropathy is going to go away right so then you end up with a mm -hmm. you know with a worse problem than you start out with which is scary so yeah so it's scary mm -hmm. i mean it, this is a this is a tricky drug mm -hmm. it's uh it has to be used with care mm -hmm. and uh, as i've said sometimes one of the difficult judgment calls is, is how do you know when to stop right yeah. Well, so one of the things that's been discussed a lot is to try to keep the dose, especially if you already have neuropathy mm -hmm. like I do, um, super low. And and I know you don't know the answer to this, and you've already told me you don't, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask it anyway. So is the super low dose maybe a good strategy? Well, it's definitely my impression that by mm -hmm. using low doses, the toxicity is definitely less. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, even though the doses are low, I mean, doses that I jokingly say they're almost homeopathic because <laughs> yeah. they're so tiny mm -hmm. that, but they're still regarding their effects on Borrelia mm -hmm. incredibly potent. Yeah. So that's what surprised me because I, I put a few patients who, who's, whose clinical status was so precarious to begin with that I started with these, well, the, initially the lowest dose that I was using mm -hmm. was 125 every third day or every fourth day. And even that, and even in a large, one of the patients was a large gentleman, 260 pounds. And he, he made dramatic improvement over weeks and months at that low dose. Mm. So, I mean, it just really, really impressed me how potent this agent is. Mm -hmm. uh, then the question is, and, and uh, that person has, has been on doses of, well, he, he has increased the dose we have increased the dose somewhat, but he was on low dose for many, many months. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I, making progress and making progress and, and, not, and not really, we're not really mm -hmm. seeing toxicity. So mm -hmm. I think that's another, that's the other thing I'm learning, you know, that there, there may be different ways in which you can use this agent one way. And, and I was influenced by the first three patients that, you know, they used a certain dose for a certain period of time. They stopped. And they seem to enjoy what I'm calling an enduring remission. And uh, the question is, can is it possible to achieve that with a lower dose over a longer period of time? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that question. I'll be your experiment. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, at some point, you you, you know, you stop and observe. Uh -huh. I, I've been going under the assumption that you needed to achieve sort of a minimal effective dose, or what I'm calling quote target dose and keep mm -hmm. the person at that dose for somewhere between six and 12 weeks and then stop and observe. Um, but I don't know whether a, a lower dose for over a longer, longer period of time, mm -hmm. I don't know whether that would uh, be able to achieve that because mm -hmm. I, I haven't had that many patients where we've done that and stopped and seen how they, you know, how they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and also it, it does become tricky as you're trying to get to that target dose, sometimes the patients are pushed over the edge, mm -hmm. even though I'm following them very carefully and, and, and they're following themselves very carefully. It gets mm -hmm. to a tricky point where, you know, sometimes um, I had one patient who was on 125 milligrams a day doing really, really well. And then she just, she added one additional 
she added 250 um, like every third day and, and and she only did one dose like that and it seemed to push her over the edge and then she, um, that particular person got into this sort of a, a odd um, emotional state that seemed to be precipitated by the and she, she'd been on um, I saw for probably four or five months so let's talk a little bit about that, right? Yeah. Because the other big fear is psychosis. Everybody yeah. thinks they're going to have irreversible neuropathy or they're going to end up in a mental institution. Yeah. So maybe you could describe, is it the dopamine increase? That I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not, so I'm not sure if the that. reason, and mm -hmm. none of the patients mm -hmm. that I've dealt with so far have had frank psychosis or anything like mm -hmm. that. Because I certain, think some people are calling it psychosis, but it, yeah. we're not really well, sure. Well, none, 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 mm -hmm. none of the patients that I've dealt with, but that I'm following very carefully. Mm -hmm. um, none of them have had frank psychosis. And even even that case one, mm -hmm. uh, he never used the word psychosis. I don't know that he needed to be psychiatrically hospitalized. So obviously mm -hmm. it, was, it was severe enough that that was required, but I, I don't even know the details of whether, he, whether there was psychosis involved or not. Um, so people are assuming that he was psychotic, but I, I, I don't know that, but he certainly, and we don't even know if it was from the disulfiram because, again, he was under a lot of situational stress for mm -hmm. other reasons. But I mean, it certainly might have had a role. So uh, well, I, I, I have a you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I, I've heard on the by word of mouth and on the Facebook groups there mm -hmm. there have been some people who really had psychosis and needed psychiatric hospitalization for that. Yes. And nobody really wants to go through that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we think it's we've had nine people say that. They think they had psychosis, mm -hmm. but I don't know the details of it. I just counted that up. Um, well, I mean, it's mm -hmm. in the literature. It's a yeah. known thing that has occurred. But mm -hmm. um, one of the one of my colleagues that who was debating this and, and sort of making it seem very scary <clears throat> went to the extent of uh, of checking on PubMed the, the total number of cases of psychosis that had been reported in the literature mm -hmm. between <clears throat> I think it was 1992 and 2016. There were only eight cases reported. Mm. So at pretty high doses, so, right? Well, I don't know the details, but milligrams probably. Uh, or what I'm what I'm pointing mm. out is that that's not a lot of cases. Right. But on the other hand, not every case that occurs gets reported. Right. So, but it's known that it can occur mm. with with this drug. Yeah, Doctor Rajadas, did you have something to add about psychosis? No, whatever you know that you know the people. Do your rats have psychosis? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your mice. No, uh, so. <laughs> In fact, uh, we, we are doing one of the questions we wanted to find out whether they have these behavioral abnormalities. You know, what we do is we give the drug uh, for the infected animal and then we watch them, their behavior, how it changes. Uh, so that experiment we are currently doing, it's a very, it takes long time to watch these animals, how they behave. Um, and you're also looking at them for neuropathy. Yeah, right? that's you're correct. Doing a study yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we will be we will have mm -hmm. some answers once we complete the study. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously it will be published very soon uh, once it is ready. Uh, but I have one particular you know like a, a thought or a, you know whatever you wanted to call. Uh, people say psychosis or whatever they say, they need to be consulting their clinician. Mm -hmm. They can't tell that I have psychosis and then That's put right. it in the Facebook because <laughs> it, it needs to be a very, very uh, validated. validated and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. people spend like 10 years, 15 years training uh, to train themselves to discern these things very clearly. What is psychosis? What is not psychosis? Mm -hmm. What is this? What is that? Even for them, you go for a second opinion because people always go for second opinion. How a patient or anybody who are taking any particular drug, they themselves, they say, I have this, I have this, I have this. No, uh, you know, let us not, um, let us, you know, um, do whatever we are supposed to do. That's what I personally think. It's my humble opinion about uh, the whole thing. Uh, we need to be very careful because uh, whatever we say other people are going to watch whatever we are telling mm -hmm. uh, so it's better to be be careful about that mm -hmm. i think that's a really good point 
So tell us a little bit more about the research that you're currently doing, and also if you could mention um, possibly antiviral effects, antifungal. We've had a lot of questions about the other benefits of using disulfiram because it does so many things, right? It's anti-inflammatory. Yes. Yeah, so uh, mm -hmm. as a drug development, uh, disulfiram is having multiple targets. And interestingly, all these targets seems to be a good end only. Uh, I don't see a lot of papers coming up with bad effects of disulfiram. Uh, so far, what I you know observe in the literature, everybody excited about this disulfiram. That's why I tell my colleagues at one point, disulfiram is likely to win the molecule of the year uh, in the way they selected other molecules which very very therapeutic the reason why because they see like for example in cancer uh, people even know the mechanism of exactly disulfiram is helping these patients and you know uh, they the cancer treatment along with the disulfiram seemingly is going to be very beneficial to people that's what uh, I observe from the literature, you know, people are very excited about it. A lot of programs uh, or people are, you know, very carefully looking at the data, including the human data. So um, then, you know, as far as the Lyme disease related work uh, for the role of Dysel from what type of impact it is giving into this, I think it's going to be a huge impact. Uh, I'm not telling disulfiram is going to be the ultimate molecule, but it is going to lead us to the ultimate therapy. That's what I think. Uh, because knowledge, data, that drives everything. So, and again, because of so much in need for this therapy, and the, the data is going to, you know, you know, there's going to be huge amount of data. We are going to be overwhelmed with the data. Once we discern all the data, perhaps in the way we developed a novel formulation to avoid the side effects, maybe the second level of molecule, third level, fourth level, fifth level, perhaps we will come up with a variety of molecule because we are going to, we, we, I think whatever the study we are currently doing, my other researchers are doing, we are going to learn a lot about how from is effective, uh, you know, how it is, whether it is how it is sterilizing it, how it is um, helping people to reduce the inflammation that is going on, how this molecule kind of literally halting like 10 years inflammation. If it is validated, if it is true, you know, in a clinical trial, uh, that's going to really help us a lot in the clinical understanding and uh, pharmacological understanding. That is going to teach us a lot of developing therapy. So I really think we are in a positive road of success. Pamela or Christina? I would like to hear about you have... your successful mouse study. That's so important to talk about. Yes, so uh, of course uh, I have to disclose this. Uh, mouse is not a small human. They are different and we are different. And whatever that works in a mouse, it need not work in human. Mm -hmm. But uh, only thing we have that, <laughs> that we don't have any better, uh, you know, animals to try, you know, how. So basically what we do, when we ask a question, we try to ask how the mammalian system is going to respond for a disulfiram. Like for example, we have an animal model to study uh, Borrelia and then these animals they have the mutation and they develop a disease and then we allow them to be not without any antibiotic after few months they develop arthritis like in the way human develop Lyme arthritis they develop they develop heart problems they develop other so it's not like we are you know uh, extrapolating so if the disulfiram is going to prevent this chronic effect, whatever this animal is undergoing because of the borrelial infection. Uh, I think there is a possibility to 
trust the data and then extrapolate in our clinical trial the same understanding how disulfiram is going to help. So what we do for uh, all our clinical studies, certain studies we can't do it in human. For example, uh, I wanted to ask a question like Borrelia, you treat with the Borrelia, how much synaptic damage is happening in the brain of this animal? Obviously, you will agree with me, you can't do it in human because what we do, we literally after we expose these animals with borrelial infection, we allow them with treatment, without treatment, like for example in this case disulfiram treatment, we just to take their uh, brain and then try to see how the neuronal damage has happened because of the borrelial infection, whether disulfiram can reverse it. This kind of questions only you can ask in animal model. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the animals, they that's why we call sacrificing the animal. We don't call slaughtering the animal. We don't destroy the animal, but we are sacrificing the animal because we learn from that. And did you find that it disulfiram reversed the synaptic damage? So uh, our uh, preliminary data, yes, mm -hmm. the answer is yes. Uh, it is. Uh, so what we found out is borrelial infection, um, uh, interestingly, upregulate a lot of uh, toxic protein pathways, including some of the aldehyde dehydrogenases pathway, highly upregulated. Any good thing, you know, if it is beyond certain point, it become a bad thing, excess. So excess is always bad. And, uh, you know, dice, uh, actually borrelial infection uh, trigger this kind of excessive up upregulation of certain proteins. And uh, interestingly, borrelia not only sterilizing the bacteria, it is also reversing this, the effects of Borrelia. Mm -hmm. So we showed, a, a, you know, early part of this year in a paper, even a small portion of the Borrelia outer coat protein might get into the brain, what kind of damages it can happen. So we asked this kind of specific question using our animal model. In fact, we have a lot of different models, different mutants. So they respond to different way to borrelial infection. Uh, some of them have a GABA depletion, some of them have a dop DOPA depletion. So different variety of model kind of representing a subgroup of people. Mm -hmm. So we can ask this kind of question. Let us say one particular case. If they have an ex pre-existing condition of developing a mild form of Parkinson's disease, so they already have problem of, you know, because of the uh, DOPA treatment, because we are giving DOPA, L-DOPA treatment, what kind of impact uh, this DOPA level is going to happen when they are concurrently taking disulfiram? This question, we have to develop an animal model and ask this question, like we measure the DOPA level, we measure the GABA level in their brain and then show Dicel from whether it is protective or it is going to be so obviously if the uh, you know Parkinson patients or you know uh, pre-existing condition we have to ask them to be away from this therapy if that is causing any kind of trouble but this needs a research we need to ask this question and get the answer and then try to uh, you know publish this work validated by others then you know then it become a knowledge so it will be a data driven a knowledge driven research so it's better to develop any therapy with the knowledge and data driven research rather than you know i he said i said he said like that mm -hmm. that's kind of dangerous way to develop anything just that um the clinicians who are going to use this drug they need to inform themselves about it so can you read up about aren't it aren't you got don't you have a little um, chat amongst all of the physicians that are using it right now? Is there some sort of, like how, what would you recommend a physician do to educate themselves? Well, first of all, mm -hmm. read my article mm -hmm. because since I'm, since in, in, in writing this article, I'm, I'm sort of suggesting or endorsing the use of disulfiram, mm -hmm. I felt obliged to kind of scour the literature and bring to people's attention the potential adverse effects mm -hmm. so that they are, are aware. Correct, yes. But also, even though I reviewed a lot of the literature in preparing that paper, 
it's definitely been a steep learning curve for me mm. in using it. Mm. Um, so, and also to be, to be cautious in its use. Mm -hmm. And uh, for neither the physician nor the patients to be overzealous in its use. Mm -hmm. Because um, using higher dosages, uh, you know, can, can lead to more risk of toxicity. Right. And although I, I am sort of adjusting the doses based roughly on weight, mm -hmm. that doesn't take everything into account. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take into account, you know, everybody's liver metabolism is different, mm -hmm. everybody's hormonal balance is different, everybody's immune system is different. So although I, I am adjusting dosage roughly based on weight, that you can't just completely rely on that. You have to be mindful of the impact it's having on the patient. So there has to be that feedback um, and, and communication between the physician and the patient and mm -hmm. careful follow-up mm -hmm. of the patient, um, uh, periodic regular surveillance labs. Mm -hmm. what, which, what, how often do you think people should well, do apps? Because people ask that frequently. And I say you require every two weeks, so I'm assuming that's your recommendation. Well, what I'm, what I'm doing now is Theoretically, I'm trying, and not everybody, not every patient is compliant with mm -hmm. it. But I'm trying to is the end of the first week, the end of the second week, the end of the fourth week, and every two weeks thereafter, okay. to be safe. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that's overkill. <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. it's not necessary. But since this is a novel use of an FDA-approved drug, you don't want to miss an adverse effect. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the the hepatic injury can be somewhat idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to wait. You it know. can happen suddenly, right? Well, if it's going to happen, and and you know, and there's some reason, um, you, you you want to pick that up early, mm -hmm. and and stop the drug if that's happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, you know, again, maybe I'm overly cautious, but better safe than sorry. It's probably you a know. good thing. Yeah. As a physician, in our parting words, what would be the research that you would like to see? On well, as I said during the talk today at Lime Mind, mm -hmm. we don't we don't really know what the mechanism of action is. Well, maybe someone right? does, and he's not telling us. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 in my article, mm -hmm. I, I speculated on four or five or six different things that I mm -hmm. thought might be the mechanism of action, but in mm -hmm. fact, I don't. Nobody really knows quite what the mechanism mm -hmm. of action is. So that would be a priority. I think it's important to define yeah. mm -hmm. what. What of the, first of all, like, like I said, the, the, the pharmacokinetics of disulfiram is very complex. Mm -hmm. So you don't know which of those metabolites is the one that's active. Is it the parent drug, mm -hmm. you know, or is it one of the breakdown products, you know? And uh, I, I speculated about the possible role of carbon disulfide today because, um, as, I, as I mentioned today, mm -hmm. um, in that Logan case, her, her tissues were full of biofilm. Mm -hmm. So biofilm is not theoretical, it's real. Right. And, and, you know, antibiotics generally are fairly large molecules. They're not going to penetrate into biofilm. The carbon disulfide is the same order of magnitude in size as carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide and oxygen go in and out of biofilm, which has a structure, it has pores, it has a the, the bacteria within biofilm have a metabolism. And it, again, pure speculation, but I'm thinking that one of the reasons that the sulfur might be helpful is that one of, I'm speculating that one of the breakdown products is known to be carbon disulfide. Carbon disulfide is recognized to have definite antibacterial properties against a lot of different bacteria. So, you know, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but it's an attractive hypothesis yeah. mm -hmm. of how, why this might be more effective than a lot of the antibiotics that we have had to rely on. Why? Because that's, it's the best that we've had. But, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of pride myself as being one of the earliest voices to say antibiotics may not be the answer. Right. Just and how we do we didn't I, have anything and else. How, well, that's what we had. And, right. I, and I know that because mm -hmm. a lot of us clinicians who were confronted with these sick patients, we found that if you treated them, they got better, and if you stopped treating them, they got worse. If you treated them, they got better. It's kind of like two plus two equals four, you know? It was very obvious. And then, you know, when I first started out, I used 
antibiotics in the same way that was recommended, but I found people would relapse. And then I would, okay, then I would double it, then I would triple it, and then I found some patients, you couldn't take them off. Because every time you took them off, no matter how long they were on, they would relapse. And actually, this work that is led by Eva Shapi, it explains how that is possible. You're just knocking it down, suppressing it. You have the large amount of beryllia within biofilm, and they're ready to resurge whenever the pressure of antibiotic treatment is stopped. So, you know, and I've said from early on, we need better methods of treatment. We need to understand um, the bacteria, and then we need to develop methods that are, you know, and I'm not even, I've not even claimed that I know that disulfiram is, quote, the cure. Because mm -hmm. I don't even have, I don't have the means to know that. All I can say is that a significant fraction of the patients who've been on it are enjoying, again, what I'm calling an enduring remission, greater than six months off treatment, remaining well. And these are patients who were, many of these patients were really, really sick and required, like, heroic antimicrobial treatment to keep their head above water. And, and for them to be able to do a, a course of disulfiram for a finite period of time and remain well off, I mean, I, I've never seen anything like that. Hmm. And that's why, that's why I wrote the article, you know? <laughs> that's why we're all here, right? That's why we're all so excited. Yeah. Well, thank you both for sharing these words of wisdom and Pamela. Oh, Pamela, question. do you have a question? Oh, I do have one. We're also here with famous science writer and yeah. Lyme <laughs> advocate. Okay. Investigative reporter. Yeah, Investigative but reporter. Here, here's my question. This, um, these reports of desulfiram have really captured the attention of, I would say, tens upon tens of thousands of persistently sick people mm -hmm. in the Lyme community. And Dr. Ligner is a very careful doctor, a very meticulous doctor, but not everybody has access to such a, to such a doctor. and a lot of people are really don't even have the money to see mm -hmm. a Lyme doctor mm -hmm. and I would say that many thousands of people are self-treating yes. with this medicine yes. and I just and given everything mm -hmm. you two have said about the side effects about the new formulation you're creating about the way you Dr. Ligner monitor your patients and pull them off if if you see a problem what do you what do you have to say to these? I think it's I think it's tens of thousands of people and desperate people desperate around people. the world and, and they're, desperate they're on people. our Facebook forum and they are self treating as you know yeah. and 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 they're mm -hmm. ordering disulfiram from, mm -hmm. from uh, India from India and there's mm -hmm. there, there there's no disulfiram left in the pharmacy there anyway. <laughs> yeah, I understand that there are people who are self treating, which I. I I can understand why they're doing it, because they're desperate and they're feeling like drowning rats. But really, um, this is a drug that needs to be used with a lot of care, and uh, really would uh, strongly recommend that any pe any person who's using it be under supervision either of a physician or some other healthcare practitioner, such as a nurse practitioner. I know that in, in certain states and provinces, uh, naturopathic physicians are uh, are licensed to prescribe medication, but uh, this is a drug that requires careful follow-up. There are potentially s quite serious adverse effects that can occur rarely, and that needs to be monitored for. And um, so uh, then... Uh, well, one it, thing people are doing mm -hmm. is they're taking your study and others um, there's not a lot of evidence, but they're taking what we have to their primary care physician or their nurse practitioner. And when they see your study and some of the other evidence showing the efficacy of disulfiram, those people are willing to prescribe it, unlike antibiotics, interestingly. So that's a strategy people have been using. And I think what you're also saying is that those practitioners need to be educated in disulfiram as well. Yes, I mean, who, whoever is prescribing Whoever is prescribing the drug should carefully inform themselves about the drug. And uh, even for me, it's been a steep learning curve. Um, and and, and patients who are taking it 
should be informed and inform themselves about the potential adverse effects of the drug, which, although rare, can be quite serious. Um, but I've also heard um, through the grapevine and from some of my own patients or people in the Lyme community that they've been quite pleasantly surprised that when they have broached the issue of possible use of disulfiram, even with infectious diseases physicians, that they've been much more open to using disulfiram than using antibiotics because disulfiram is not an antibiotic in the usual sense. Um, as far as I know, it doesn't really mess with the, with the, the GI tract, and uh, uh, as, uh, I, don't, I might be repeating myself, but I, I don't even recommend using uh, probiotics because I haven't found it necessary. Uh, we've never had any patient thus far in, in, in two years have any issue with, uh, with severe diarrhea or C. diff or anything like that. So, um, And what labs do you recommend? Um, what frequency? Yeah, well, uh, what I call surveillance labs uh, is a, a complete blood count with diff, uh, AST, ALT, EGT, totally bil total, total bilirubin, BUN, creatinine, CPK, and urinalysis. And I, I've been recommending patients do it at the end of weeks one, end of weeks two, end of week four, and then every two weeks thereafter. Uh, the, the hepatic injury that sometimes occurs in it with disulfiram can be idiosyncratic and you want to pick that up early um, if that's going to happen. And will that show up on lab so a, well, a practitioner maybe is not that familiar with disulfiram would know there was something wrong? Well presumably you, you'd see uh, elevate, elevation in liver function tests and mm -hmm. if, it, if it's significant then you have to stop. You know. That was great. Thank you Dr. Ligner. You're very welcome Beverly. I really appreciate it. Okay. You being my doctor and okay introducing me to disulfiram which has really improved my health in the last two months that's, that i've been taking it and i wouldn't have been able to make it till eight o'clock tonight so i'm really grateful okay. for everything you've done for the lung community thank you you're very welcome okay thank you everyone thank you thank you very much